Great, well thanks everyone for showing up um, and finding us on the fourth floor. Uh, hopefully we'll have a few more people trickling in as, uh, as we get going here. Um, and yeah, I'm going to keep a short introduction today. My name is Greg Stiegel. I'm the Operations Director for Renewable Energy Alaska Project. Um, welcome to the second installment of our speaker series. Um, yeah, for any newcomers, REAP is a 501c3 nonprofit organization in town here, and uh, we work on advocacy and education to uh, advance renewable energy in the state. Uh, I'm going to kind of leave our organization intro at that because I think Chris is going to get into some of that stuff uh, in his little presentation. Um, and yeah, part of our outreach effort is putting on these events. Uh, and we're so happy to be able to provide them free of charge, and uh, we couldn't do that without our, our sponsors. So just want to take a quick second to thank our sponsors for supporting us. Uh, we have two leading sponsors, BP and the Municipality of Anchorage Solid Waste Services, uh, and our supporting sponsors are the Denali Commission, Doyon, Chugach Electric Association, Siri, the Alaska Center, and the Anchorage Museum is an in-kind sponsor for us. Uh, we had our first event two weeks ago on electric, ve electric vehicles, which was a great turnout. Um, and just a, a quick uh, rundown of our upcoming events. On November 5th, we'll be in Fairbanks, uh, and we'll be talking about paths to cleaner, more affordable, and resilient electricity. We'll be live streaming that event, so if you can't make it up there, keep an eye out for our website and Facebook page if you want to check that one out. Um, November 7th, uh, we'll be back here on the fourth floor in the museum talking about the rail belt electric grid. And then November 21st, we'll be talking about tidal energy. We'll have an update from Levi Kilcher of NREL and an ORPC representative um, to give an update on what they got going on in the state. Uh, now on to tonight's event. To thank our panelists for being here. We've got a great lineup. Um, REAP has worked uh, with ASEP for many years and has been excited to work with Launch uh, Alaska uh, as, as they've been kicking off. Uh, and, and there's kind of a natural coalescence of our three organizations working together. Um, so yeah, the point of this event here is to kind of highlight uh, the work that each of these organizations are doing individually and, and how they have come together and, and, are, and are working to advance clean energy in Alaska. Um, so yeah, we're gonna hear a short presentation from each panelist uh, with a little slideshow, and then they're gonna dive into a conversation together, sort of interviewing uh, each other, and then we'll open it up to some question and answer at the end of the evening. Uh, so yeah, just short introduction for each one. We've got Chris Rose, the founder and executive director of Renewable Energy Alaska Project. Uh, Isaac Vanderberg, who is the CEO of Launch Alaska, and Gwen Holdman, uh, who is the founder and director of the Alaska Center for Energy and Power, um, which is part of UAF. So I think I'll leave it at that and turn it over to Chris to kick it off. So I, I think a lot of folks know who REAP is and what we do, but I'm going to give you a little bit of context for the discussion tonight, um, and that is about building a clean energy economy in, in the state of Alaska. Uh, that's something that a lot of jurisdictions around the country and around the world are talking about. And the three organizations that you see represented up here on the stage are among, or, among several other organizations that are working together to actually figure out how to do that. And I'm going to just kind of focus on the, the last part, our mission. So our mission is simply to increase the production of renewable energy and uh, promote energy efficiency in the state through four different means, collaboration, education, training, and advocacy. And I'm going to really focus a lot on the education and the training because that's kind of our role in this, um, this partnership that we have with Launch and ASAP and others. Uh, obviously, it's very difficult to have a clean energy economy if you don't have people who are trained and educated to take care of this equipment and who are who are also part of the group that uh, may be doing research and development, but we have to build career paths for these kids. And so a large part of what we're doing is K-12 education. Colleen Fisk, our um, education director, is here in the front, and she works with like three other folks here on the REAP staff that are really focused simply on K-12 education, training opportunities, and pulling together uh, the university uh, workforce uh, development and the K-12 sector so that those sectors start to know 
who else is in it, and how they can work together. So that's a big part of what we're doing in this partnership that we're talking about tonight. Um, this is part of the, the why. So why. Why should we be caring about this? Um, this Monday, just a couple days ago, the International Energy Agency uh, reported in their, in their latest 2018 report, they're, they're expecting that clean energy worldwide is going to grow, expand by 50% um, in the next five years. So that's part of what's going on here is that we've got this huge expansion of clean energy. It's policy driven in many ways. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But this is happening. So the question is, is Alaska going to be part of it or not? Um, uh, or is America going to be part of it? We're all going to, I think, ultimately be big consumers of clean energy products and services. The question is, will we also be ones who are actually providing them? And that's kind of what we're, we're, we're looking at in terms of the work we're doing together. And the agency also noted that the challenges that remain are policy and regulatory uncertainty, uh, high investment risk and system integration of wind and solar. And I thought this was a great quote to frame the conversation tonight because in large part, one of the things that REAP is doing in this partnership is focusing on that policy uncertainty. One of the things that LAUNCH is doing is focusing on that investment risk. And one of the things that ASEP is doing is focusing on how to integrate wind and solar and the technical aspects of the R&D for that. So this is part of the reason why we're doing all this. Um, energy policy, again, it's one of the things that I focus on. And these are different drivers. Uh, whether we like it or not, these things are happening, technology is innovating, and we are going to have to find ways to uh, fit that into the policy that we have. Um, fuel price volatility is here to stay when we're talking about fossil fuels. For instance, here in Alaska, we may have, be producers of oil and gas, but we get no home down discount at all. In fact, the, the, the uh, utilities here in the rail that are paying almost three times what utilities in the lower 48 pay for natural gas as feedstock, almost three times. Yet we're, we're um, developing it right here offshore. Um, changing consumer preferences is, de is definitely making a dent in policy because people are just deciding they want clean energy, particularly when it comes to industry. And you look at uh, Facebook and Google and all those folks, they're, they're saying we want 100% renewable electricity. Grid resiliency and security, that's really come up a lot lately in the, in the sense of what, what's happened in California. Uh, right now, I think 170,000 people have just been turned off. Last week, it was more than that. And there were a lot of vulnerable people who were, and communities that were left discussing it with each other, going, well, why, why are we on this grid anyway? Maybe we should have a microgrid. Maybe we should have a smaller grid that's more local, more resilient, and so on. But there's a lot of... There's a lot of uh, security risks uh, worldwide um, that are being addressed through this policy. And last, climate change writ large. I mean, climate change is driving this. So again, uh, one of the things that we try to focus on is the policy, and we don't have one in the state. We have programs that have been really helpful, but we do not have any domestic energy policy in the state of Alaska. That is a policy um, that is focused on how Alaskans are going to produce and consume um, energy. This is just a quick slide to show how quickly, well, this doesn't show how quickly, but just how cheap renewable energy is now. I, I left out some other slides that, that showed the trajectory of how quickly um, clean energy has changed in price over uh, the last decade or so. But if you look at this slide, you'll see that, uh, and I'm not sure if this works or not, uh, land-based wind here is between 2.9 and 5.6 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and solar is not that far behind. Um, if you already have fully appreciated nuclear or coal, it might be in that range. But right now, basically, wind, land-based wind is the cheapest electricity you can produce uh, on the planet. And that's only going to get cheaper, depending on the jurisdiction you're in, and solar is following it. So again, this is happening. How is Alaska going to respond to it? Um, this is just a... Uh, <clears throat> This is a reminder that Alaska also has a lot of opportunities in the energy efficiency space. We are estimating that we are uh, literally wasting about a billion dollars worth of energy a year in Alaska collectively when we look at the amount of energy that we're using for transportation, heating, and electricity. We're, we're probably wasting 20% of the $5 billion that we're collectively spending on energy every year. So 
that's a billion dollars we could be keeping in our economy, and there's a lot of investments that we could be making, a lot of jobs that we could be creating to, to get there. So Arctic, that's what we're calling this partnership, Alaska Regional Collaboration and Technology Innovation and Commercialization. The Office of Naval Research is supporting all of our organizations to get this done, and Arctic is you know, kind of a fan, funny uh, acronym that I have to actually read because I can't remember <laughs> what it means. But um, the idea is we're working together because we all different. We have different uh, uh, you know, skill sets and, and niches. Um, and here you can see the rest of the Arctic partners besides the, the three of us. Uh, also at the university is the UAA Business Enterprise Institute, and then up at UAF, UAF uh, the Office of Intellectual Property, uh, and Center Rice. So that's who we are. Um, we have three organizations here tonight to talk about it, and I'll turn it over to Isaac. Thanks, Chris, and, um, and thanks also to Reed for putting this event on and for, um, for hosting us, inviting us, and this is a great series. And, um, and also, um, you know, from, from Lime's Alaska's perspective, it's, this kind of partnership is, um, is perfect because if you look at the companies that we're working with, um, the challenges that they're facing are really policy and regulatory challenges. Like, we're doing a good job of you know, finding them opportunities and finding, you know, finding companies that have technologies that are ready to go and have good business models. The, but the, at the end of the day, the thing that is keeping, from, from our perspective, um, this from really catching fire in Alaska is getting that, that policy and regulatory environment going. Um, and so this partnership with, with REAP is, is tremendously valuable and is actually like critical to our organization's future success. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, you know, Launch Alaska, many of our companies currently come from outside the state, um, something that we really want to change, and in order for that to change, we need um, the university to be playing an outsized role in creating talent and in capturing some of the research, the great research that they're already doing, and, and commercializing it and putting it into a, an entrepreneurial firm so that folks that come through our accelerator um, you know, are ready to go and, and that, um, that they're kind of uh, ready for, for prime time. And so working with Gwen and all the work that she's doing, just um, heroic work at the university, is perfect because we need that pipeline of talent and, um, and, um, and companies starting to be spun out of the, out of the local kind of technical world. Um, so Launch Alaska's mission is accelerating the resource revolution. What the heck does that mean? Um, to us, that means that we are um, decarbonizing and electrifying food, water, transportation, and energy systems. You know, this, this kind of transition, this energy transition that's underway um, is being driven by all sorts of things, fundamental economics, these, you know, um, uh, decarbonized technologies are now cost competitive, just, you know, even, even though renewables don't re receive subsidies the way that other, you know, carbon-based fuel systems do, they're still cost competitive. Um, so the technology is there, society, corporate procurement, there's all these great global vectors that are, that are you know, spurring on the kind of decarbonization of these energy systems. And so what we're trying to do is we think that the solutions to decarbonize and electrify food, water, transportation, energy, many of those are largely there, like the ones we need for the next 20 years are largely there. Um, and so how do we deploy those and get those out in the field, get those tested, and our view, um, based off of work that, you know, kind of foundations that Chris and Gwen have laid. Um, our view is that like Alaska can be this world-class deployment ground for those solutions that are ready to go. If we can bring these amazing companies to partner up with our local utilities and our municipalities, um, our, our native corporations, um, our communities, that they can validate their tech, they can validate their business model, they can get some revenue, they can show that like it can make it through a whole winter and the kids won't shoot holes in the solar panels, you know, like which is an actual challenge. Um, and, and that from there they could go from here to much larger markets. So Alaska should be this. Um, Gwen talks about the Iceland model. We know Iceland has done geothermal. Um, we could be that for for kind of technologies and for our transportation energy. Um, and so our program is one where we bring in <coughs> All of these exciting companies, um, we recruit globally. So if you look at um, the folks who came in through our last program, um, actually, I'm going backwards. We get together, we first ask a bunch of really smart people in Alaska what their challenges and what their problems are. So people like 
uh, are on the screen behind me. Um, folks from ASAP, um, and you know, we talked to Chris um, and folks at Reed, we talked to the utilities, we talked to some of the corporates, and asked them what kind of problems that they see that exist in Alaska. We try to take that problem set and compare it to some exciting global markets, and then we recruit companies with solutions for those um, problems. And then the people behind me, we bring them up for a day of basically speed dating at the museum, and they bump into all of these companies that we've asked to come up. Um, the companies are coming to Alaska not because like we're really good looking or like, you know, we're so fancy. It's because, um, or, or, and they don't come for the money, um, but what they're coming for is an opportunity to actually deploy their tech in a real world setting, show that it works, um, and they go from here to larger markets. Um, and, and so these, these companies, um, I'm kind of doing this backwards, which I'm just gonna go with it here. I'm gonna come back to that slide. So the event that we had this last year was the beginning of our 2019 program, and we had all these amazing companies coming up. Um, it runs the gamut um, from Proterra, which is kind of the company that doesn't look like anyone else up there. It's uh, the world's largest manufacturer of electric buses, and they've got you know 500 employees, and they're adding 100 more. Uh, they're they're a little different than the rest of the companies up there. So, uh, many of the other companies are very small, like average five employees. Um, but it runs the gamut, you know, from um, some folks that are trying to create um, hydrogen um, using different um, methods. There's a group that has a, a little pigeon that reads a meter and sends the uh, reads a water meter and sends it back to the water utility. And that company just cracks me up. The whole pigeon thing just is hilarious <laughs> to me. But it's a really neat technology. Um, another company, um, you know, a group that has sensors that helps um, fishermen um, um, uh, recover tackle, which is you know multi-billion dollar per, uh, problem every year of the lost tackle in the fishing industry. So I have the sensor so that you can go and recover that tackle. Um, really interesting group of uh, companies. And I think we had you know 28 sign up, of which two were from Alaska, uh, or three were from Alaska this year. Um, and we spent a day at the, uh, here at the museum downstairs, and we took, you know, we had a speed dating session in the morning, and then in the afternoon we had each company did like a 15 minute pitch and uh, we did kind of like a Shark Tank thing. And then at the end of that day, the panelist who you saw on the previous page, if the panelist stood up and said, yes, like this belongs in Alaska, this solves one of our problems, we have a, a bead on, a, on an actual project or an opportunity for this company to deploy, then that's the company's ticket to come back eight weeks later. And we do that four times. Um, and so, and then, uh, and with eight weeks between each session, so it's an eight, eight week program, and then by the time we're done, we think there will be like four to ten companies left standing, um, and we actually make a little investment in the company at that point, and, um, and we, you know, we try to um, get them to, to grow and actually deploy in Alaska. Um, I'm going to go back one slide here, cut, cut me off, Greg. I'm, Kind of, I kind of black out when I'm presenting, so I don't know if I've gone on for like an hour already, or five minutes. Um, okay, thanks. Um, and so this is just a breakdown of where the companies are coming from. Um, you can see, um, you know, uh, 11 or 12 percent, I think, was the statistic this year from out. Or no, 22 percent international, about 60 percent from Alaska, 60 from lower 48. You can see the breakdown. This was the first year where we did food, water, and transportation. We've are, are always been really focused on energy. Um, and so now, the, for the first time, we added these other verticals and we have a few applicants there. Um, so just kind of interesting to see where folks are coming from. And the, the good news is that we get more applicants every year. For the last three years, we've had better applicants, better quality. Um, and we're getting, you know, out of the 13 um, companies that we've invested in right here, um, they're all still alive. Five of them actually have revenue in the state, um, and they're all growing in value. We had one company that, um, that the founder was actually killed in a car accident, which is a terrible story this last year. But other than that, um, all of the companies are, are alive and going, and many of these companies are now, you know, Box Power has hired um, someone in Alaska. Signal is wanting to incorporate in Alaska and they're looking for investments. We're, we're hooking them up with Alaska investors and they want to open up an office here. Um, and so like, 
you know, we're, we're taking the long view, but if you look at accelerators globally, about half of the companies that go through an accelerator end up relocating to the community where the accelerator is. So our hope is that over the next 10 years, we get more companies coming in. We also have some of the companies that come through our program, like, you know, meet people here, use our trail system, like, fall in love with people, <laughs> like that's actually, we're kind of like a dating, a dating component to what we're doing. But that is what keeps these companies um, in the States. Um, I just wanted to real quickly, a really interesting um, company that I think does a nice job of, it, of illustrating um, what we're trying to do is a group called Box Power that um, uh, came to us, uh, they have this 20 foot Connex container with a 50 kilowatt solar array and a battery bank and like a diesel backup generator. Um, it's an interesting company because their technology, there's not anything actually that's, there's no like special sauce there. There's no like IP that they have created that's so advanced. What they're doing is basically just taking components that exist, combining it in a way that makes sense based on the needs of people in rural communities. And, and it's a business model innovation and a kind of assembly of different parts in a way that is rugged and works in Alaska. So they delivered a few units out to Buckland last year, ran them through the winter, they survived, they performed well. Um, the community of Deering has now ordered a few more, so they delivered three more. Meanwhile, you know, as Chris was talking about earlier, um, the, the incredible fires and the, um, the stuff that's going on with PGE in California, all of a sudden, now that they've done a few deployments in Alaska and they can actually point to these things working, their order list, people are calling them up and being like, screw this, we want to get off the grid. Can we get one of your units at our school, at our campus throughout California? So all of a sudden, whereas these, these six units that they delivered were, you know, 95% of their sales funnel, now, all of a sudden, because they've demonstrated that, they're getting this massive push, and they've hired Alaskans, and they would love to, you know, they, they also have plans to do a lot of stuff in the Nana region next year. It's just a really exciting story that just brings it all together, and, um, and Nana has, you know, interacted with the REAP team and, and, um, and ASAP, and we've all, you know, we're all kind of wrapping our arms around this company. Um, but we have several success stories like that that are just like, you know, like this stuff works. The theory behind what we're trying to do um, actually seems to be to be panning out. Um, so, anyhow, stay tuned. Um, hopefully, we can get more of these companies that were up here in 2019 um, to do actual projects, and we can tell their success stories in coming years as well. So, yeah. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Lynn. So, I guess um, what I thought I would start out at in talking a little bit about is like why would the Navy have interest in Alaska. Obviously, DOD is a major player up here in the state. Um, we have uh, uh, deep roots and deep relationships with the defense um, industry or defense, um, you know, especially the Air Force and the Army. Uh, the Navy has not been as big of a player in Alaska. Um, but uh, there are these really interesting ties because I think that's one of the things that we asked too when we first um, started this partnership with the Office of Naval Research is how are the things that we're doing in Alaska actually relevant to what you're doing? And one of the ways that it is relevant is that um, there are a lot of analogies between the way that we produce and deliver power here in Alaska and um, needs for remote uh, deployment sites around the world and around the, the globe, especially when we um, have a, a kind of a, a challenging and, and, and a lot of unknowns in terms of geopolitics um, internationally. And so the Arctic is of interest to them broadly, but also some of the ways that we're actually doing things innovatively and differently here in Alaska. And I don't think that we think about those sorts of things a lot. But a big piece of it um, is really uh, the fact that because we have such a large geography here, such a big state, such a big place with so few people, um, we uh, have to find creative ways to make sure that we can provide um, communities with resilient and reliable power. So when you look at like PG&E and the situation in California with the wildfires where there's a lot of um, you know, uh, uncertainty about delivery of electric power services to certain customers there. Um, we've dealt with those sorts of things in Alaska over time for different reasons. Some of that is due to natural disaster um, challenges, but a lot of it is also just because of the fact that it is 
um, a large geography and we have vulnerabilities in terms of lack of redundancy in a lot of our um, infrastructure. So, um, so microgrids is one example of that. So I just kind of give this um, small definition of what a microgrid is, which is essentially whether it's um, maybe a na naval ship that basically is sort of an island of power, an island of how they're producing and using electric power um, and power for propulsion and um, it within a ship board system or in a remote community in Alaska. Um, that's another example of that. Now, um, I would like to also argue, though, and, and this is, I, I'll just show this graph really quickly. This is data from a company called Navigant Research. And so, you know, Alaska um, is a pretty small place when you look at the, the population, but when you look at the installed capacity of microgrids in Alaska, we're number one in the country. And when you look globally, we actually have about 12% of the installed systems um, around the world. And this isn't based on our data. This is based on data from Navigant Research. And that's not just on the number of installed systems, but the actual installed capacity um, of those systems, which I think is pretty interesting. And when you look at some of the other states that kind of pop up on here, there are a lot of states that you um, that have had challenges related to reliable and resilient power systems, a lot of them because they have suffered from challenges related to natural disasters um, historically. And so they've been investing in um, this kind of microgrid, this sort of reinventing the way we're delivering um, power uh, to our customers. Now, in Alaska, you know, there are these remote communities and there are clearly these microgrids, these little islands of electric power. Um, however, our rail belt system actually is very much also just a series or a network of individual microgrids that are nested or linked or interconnected. And a lot of people would argue that this is actually the way our electric infrastructure at the national level is going to be um, developed out in the future, that we're sort of evolving toward um, not so much sort of a centralized delivery of power with one directional, um, you know, delivery to customers that are sometimes far away from a central power plant facility, but much more sort of bi-directional um, delivery of energy where producers or customers are also producing some of their own electric power, putting that back on the grid, where you've got these kind of resilient sort of areas that um, can uh, disconnect from the grid when there's some sort of disruption of power. So that's where someone like Box Power comes in to sort of develop those sorts of services and provide that opportunity for reliable power even in the face of some sort of um, challenge to the grid as a whole. So this is um, for Alaska. Um, you know, I just like, I'll just take Fairbanks as an example here. Um, we've got the UAF grid. That's a, an individual microgrid that typically generates its own power. Um, it's mostly providing heat uh, for the campus and then the electric power is essentially almost a byproduct. Um, you've got the, the bases in Fairbanks. And then the Fairbanks grid as a whole um, can isolate or island from Anchorage um, for whatever reason that might be necessary. There's some vulnerabilities in that transmission line, and there's also times where Anchorage decides they have some disruptions to um, power supply down here, and Fairbanks gets cut off first. <laughs> um, but anyway, we have a, a large battery system that's been operating to kind of support that northern end of the um, of the rail belt inner tie system. And when this was installed, it was one of the largest battery systems in the world. And so these are examples of how Alaska has been sort of pioneering um, technologies and solutions for a really long time. We just haven't thought about it that way because it's just the way that we're delivering power and kind of solving our own um, challenges in Alaska. So when we look at these sorts of um, areas where we're incorporating renewable resources, Alaska has a, a very high proportion of communities that have a um, that have over 10% uh, total contribution of renewables um, to their grid. And a lot of those include variable resources which are harder to incorporate um, at high levels. And there's a lot of places in Alaska where we're pushing above 100% penetration of wind um, energy in particular um, at any one point in time, which is much more than most utilities would accept. And we're doing that because we have the resource availability and because we're trying to displace imported fossil fuels and our utilities are willing to accept more risk often um, than utilities in other places. Um, this is a view of the circumpolar Arctic. And so this challenge around remoteness and high cost of energy um, that creates an opportunity to think of 
novel solutions and to do things that are um, cost effective uh, at today's price points um, in these remote areas. This is a challenge all around the Arctic. So you can kind of see in this image the, the gray area, sort of the, the edge of the, the northern edge of sort of the, the North American electric grid or the continental electric grids on, on both continents. And beyond that, about 20% of the land mass in the entire world, which is part of this northern or Arctic region, is not grid connected. You know, you either have something like the rail belt grid, which in itself is not connected to Canada or to the rest of the United States, so we're sort of this isolated regional grid, or you have all these dots here that represent remote communities across the Arctic region that are mostly reliant on fossil fuels and importing um, those fuels. So there's some really interesting innovations happening in the Arctic. We just don't often think of the Arctic as a region. And a lot of these regional grids, like the rail belt, or um, our grid in southeast Alaska, or Iceland, which I would also consider to be a regional grid, they actually have a very high proportion of renewables that are connected to them. Iceland's sort of a poster child of um, renewable energy development in many ways between their hydro and their geothermal resources. Um, but there's a lot of pretty innovative things happening in the Arctic, and Alaska is not lagging in this area. And I think that um, what I'm interested in seeing is how we can convert some of the innovation that's happening in the Arctic into um, really more entrepreneurship so that we can get more companies with some of the ideas that are being pioneered here in Alaska to be um, participating in Launch Alaska and ultimately trying to capture what I view as like a larger global market for some of these strategies and technologies. So, I mean, I'll just give like one example. This is a small community that I view as kind of like a, a leader in this sort of transition to clean energy, Kongikanak. They have a system that was developed by an Alaska company, Intelligent Energy Systems, and um, they uh, got to 65% displaced fuel, including seven days straight, where they were running with their diesels turned off um, last January, which is really um, quite advanced, you know. And this is, um, these are things that are happening here in Alaska today. You mentioned the communities of Buckland and Deering. I think they've both um, operated now with their diesels turned off for periods of time. These are sort of like, really, this is sort of the next generation. This is where people are trying to, to move the technology to, and Alaska's really been um, leading the way in, in many ways. So our role at the university, I'm, I'm gonna keep this a little bit short, but we were formed um, 10 years ago, 11 years ago maybe now, um, really with the goal of trying to uh, help Alaskans address the energy challenges that they're facing. And so really looking at very um, applied research that's directly meeting the needs of Alaska's utilities, our communities, and our industries in trying to um, find ways to reduce their energy costs and improve um, their processes related to energy management. And so, um, so we're based at UAF, but we also have an office here in Anchorage on a UAA campus. Actually, one of our researchers, um, Chris Pike, uh, who works in our solar program, is, is here. Chris, if you don't mind. So if you have any Anchorage-based questions, you can ask Chris about that. Um, but anyway, yeah, and or ice cream. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so, so basically we also operate a lab. And so one of the things that we learned is that we want to kind of minimize failures um, in the field in Alaska. So wherever possible, we want things to fail in sort of a controlled environment before we send them out to the field because we've had a lot of failures um, in places in Alaska in the past and we want to try to minimize that. So we've developed a laboratory up in Fairbanks that mimics or emulates one of these microgrids at full power levels um, around the size of a community like Kongiganak, for example. Um, so, uh, so we operate this lab, um, reduce the problems in the field. We're also really looking at how we can use this as a training resource, and this is kind of where we're working um, with REAP, for example, on things like that, and um, figuring out how we can really push the envelope and, and how we can start to look at what the next, the next generation, what the new evolution of technology is, and working with the companies um, in Launch Alaska to try to um, make sure that their technology is hardened in ways that it's ready to actually send out into the field. And so just, I, I, I put this example in, um, it's, it's uh, just one of many, but um, this is a uh, flywheel that we um, tested and integrated with an inverter package um, and then sent it out into a remote mine in the Canadian Arctic. I kind of use this example because we work pretty internationally. Um, uh, ASAP, our program, and a lot of actually organizations in Alaska have an international footprint. And so I think that that's one thing that we're trying to continue to leverage and, and build on. 
And so this system was installed at a mine in northern Quebec, and that's an example of an environment where you really cannot accept any sort of failure. You couldn't have a wind system or a flywheel, in this case, disrupt power flow to a mine. And so you want to make sure that any failures that you see, and we did experience some failures, is going to happen in the lab. We're able to test things. Um, in the same sorts of environmental conditions um, that you might see in, in the field, and then we can make sure that uh, we reduce the risk to the, um, to the end user. So that's the kind of thing that we do. And I just kind of want to um, highlight that um, I really believe that Alaskans are doing amazing things. I am inspired by people here in the state every day. And um, this is kind of where I think that we need to uh, leverage um, the expertise, the experience we have here, um, work to continue to build that through training of our youth, um, education of our youth, and then um, figure out a way where we can really try to leverage um, the experience and know-how that we've developed from our own systems to try to um, deal with some of these challenges at the more international and global level. So how can we learn from what's happening internationally, but how can Alaskans also be part of global solutions in this space? So, and that's it. Well, I'm going to kick off the, the questioning here of each other by maybe asking when to follow up on the last things you talked about and, and may perhaps talk about an example of one or two uh, companies or ideas that, that are out there for Alaskans and Alaskans' expertise to help people outside, not technology necessarily, but maybe service industry and so on. I know that there's been a lot of discussion about Alaskan expertise being uh, exported around the world, and um, maybe talk a little bit about the, the possibility for that. Yeah, so, um, so one thing that we've been doing is we've been um, working with uh, a number of different, especially Alaskan, both utilities, but, but some of the, the companies that we have active in this space. The people that have this really deep um, know-how on how to actually make these systems function in these remote areas often are um, part of nonprofit organizations, you know. Um, a lot of our utilities in the state are um, cooperatives or municipally owned utilities, and there's really not a profit motive. There's not very many IOU kind of utilities in the state. And so um, they often come up with a really good idea on how to solve a problem, but there's not necessarily really some kind of a, a motivation for them to convert that into some sort of intellectual property that they might be able to patent or um, spin into a product or a company or something like that. And so what we've been doing is we've been um, forming a group called um, the Alaska Microgrid Group with the goal of kind of pooling some of the most talented Alaskans in this space and then um, finding ways that we can more actively get involved in projects in other markets. And so um, one example of that right now is in um, Nunavut uh, in the Canadian Arctic. Uh, they are very interested in developing wind energy. Both Nunavut and Greenland are interested in expanding wind energy technologies, and they're quite interested in bringing Alaskans in. So it's a question of how can the Alaskans that have the most knowledge and know-how about developing these systems actually actively participate in projects in other markets in ways that, does, that, that works with their kind of their day job, I guess you could say, um, back here uh, in Alaska. So that's something that we've been working on pretty actively. And another place is also in Iceland, frankly. Um, they uh, have done a very good job on renewables. They're probably one of the, the top in the world, but they have one remote community that's Similar kind of thing like in Alaska, it's, it's easy to run diesels. There's a reason why these communities are on diesels, because diesel fuel is a really good storage mechanism. It's pretty, you know, it's a, it's a way that you can store energy and access it when you need it. And so um, we're working with them to see how um, lessons learned from Alaska might be applied um, for this particular community in Iceland as well. And so anyone that's interested in potentially being part of this, um, we'd be interested in, in chatting with you, because I think there's a lot of potential there. Thanks, Gwen. Uh, I, I'm going to ask Isaac a question, too, and then maybe you guys can ask me or each other some questions that we'll get to uh, audience participation in a second. But there's also been uh, a lot more talk recently about this concept of beneficial electrification, which is essentially uh, replacing fossil fuels, not just in the power sector, but also in the transportation and the heating sector with renewables. So the idea of not just looking at electricity, but how, you know, how, where are we getting our heating fuel, where we're getting our transportation fuel. And, and Isaac, you talked about how uh, Launch's uh, mission, I think, is really broader than just energy, even talking about water and 
food systems, and I'm wondering uh, if you could just talk a little bit more about some of the companies uh, that you have had experience with, or some of the problems that you have seen in, in the midst of the work uh, in addressing the, the, the food security issues that we may have uh, here in the state, or even water. Sure. Uh, and so, yeah. Um, you know, from our perspective, the the like the generation side of all of this stuff is um, is being sorted out um, by you know there's some big players that are put putting out solar and wind and even in the battery space um, and I think there's some like really big players in that space and it's going to be sorted out kind of by who wins the you know, the RFPs, these big RFPs that utilities are putting out, and there's a bunch of folks that have battery technology and solar and wind now, and there's this churn going on where I think, like, the natural cycle is that in the next five years, a few of those companies will win, and those will be the big suppliers, and kind of wind and solar and batteries will become kind of like a commodity, and it'll be a race to the bottom. And from a startup perspective, um, there are some very niche applications that like we be in, that we're still interested in in terms of like companies that are producing um, any kind of generation technology like maybe someone that can have a wind turbine that survives out in the out in the Aleutians would be a real niche that we that we're still excited about or one, like one of the companies in our portfolio is um, is uh, Oklo which is a, a company that has been working with ASAP and um, is a small micro um, um, small micro uh, reactor um, that, uh, that's a fascinating technology um, that is actually going to have an unveiling on November 7th in DC here and like you know their long term plan is to have energy that's at fractions of a penny you know per kilowatt hour so that's like that's a game changing technology that we're interested in also but really the stuff that, that I'm more excited about these days is is not so much just the generation side because that seems to be like the EIA you know study that you had EIA is already saying it's going to be 50%. And EIA, if you look at what they've done in the past, have actually underestimated how quickly renewables are going to be taken over. They've been like, they get a lot of criticism for being too conservative, so I think it's going to even happen faster than what EIA is saying it's going to happen at. Um, but all these other technologies that are enabling this resource revolution to happen are really exciting, and things like um, uh, firms that have uh, you know, augmented, augmented reality um, um, applications so that you know uh, utility managers can go in and um, you know they can wear a piece of goggles that tells them exactly how to go in and manage the equipment. Um, you know some of the blockchain stuff is a space that's really exciting um, where you know uh, markets in the lower 48. And the conversation is kind of kind of starting up here where where you know people can trade electrons between their their electric vehicle and the utility, you know, and that um, and different different parts of the grid, um, and they can establish like a real time market using blockchain technology and do this peer to peer energy transacting. Like this is where the world is going, and there are firms working on this stuff. And, and a lot of those technologies are really exciting. And also the reason that you know we focus on the on the food, water, transportation, energy is because if you solve some of these problems. Like if you solve the peer-to-peer -peer energy transaction thing, you're also solving a big problem for our ability to deploy EVs at scale because you know utilities are, are scratching their heads right now trying to figure out what the business case is around EVs and how do you value a battery that pulls up to your grid and tries to charge and who's what's the value stack there? Like what is the what does the vehicle owner pay for? What does the utility pay for? Who makes the money? Blockchain starts to answer some of those issues. So that's like an, ener like an energy transportation nexus thing. Um, if you're trying to solve a lot of the food resilience and food security issues, you're oftentimes having to solve energy issues, and you're having to solve transportation issues. Um, so, so all this stuff, it's, it's all tied together, um, which is you know, this nexus that people talk about between food, water, transportation, and energy. Um, the, the companies that we're working with Oftentimes, so it was interesting in our, in our most recent um, event that we ran, we tried to, we started out by separating the companies into a food track, a water track, a transportation track, and an energy track. And then we tried to select panelists because we're like, hey, you're, a, you're an energy panelist, you're a food panelist, you're a water panelist. 
and it really quickly came back to us that people were like, I know I'm from a utility, you know, I'm at MEA, Julie Esty, but we're really looking at the food industry and the growing industry, um, you know, all kinds of growing, and we're looking at EVs, and so I don't want to just be in energy, I want to be in transportation, I want to be in food, I want to be in water, because this is all part of what our utility is talking about. Or we'd have someone that's in the ocean, we thought they were a water person, and they're like, no, we don't want to just be ocean, we want to know what kind of renewable, what the trends are in renewables and in energy and in food and, and you know, um, so all this stuff is all converging and, um, and many of the companies that we're working with like are aware of that, they get that, they get that they're operating in this space where everything is kind of converging under one, um, under one umbrella, yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question. But, um, what should we do next? I have should a question to, for to Chris. Each other? Yeah. 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 Um, I, I have a question for you, Chris, because um, you know one of the things that uh, I was speaking or uh, communicating with uh, uh, somebody that's, that's um, developed projects in Alaska, renewable energy projects, and one of the things is that you know, we've built a lot of systems over the last decade. A lot of those were um, uh, uh, benefited by the Renewable Energy Grant Fund, which you had a pretty big hand in developing through REAP. Um, I uh, am curious to know what your thoughts are in terms of long-term kind of operation and maintenance challenges and how we make sure that these systems um, continue to operate in the future. Like to what extent is that a training question? To what extent is there, you know, costs associated with that? How do we make sure that these systems that we're investing in are actually going to um, serve the sorts of um, functions that we expect them to over the kinds of timelines that we hope that they can do that? That's a great question because when you put in a renewable energy project next to, let's say, a diesel system, um, it's going to last for 20, 25 years. And over that time, not only are you going to have to operate and maintain it, but there's probably going to be some opportunities to op optimize it because there'll be other technologies that come in, like new battery storage or new control systems. And if you don't have somebody in the community or looking out for the community who is trained to recognize those opportunities, then you may have, uh, you may miss an opportunity to, uh, to optimize the system. But uh, just bare bones, you have to operate and maintain it correctly, as you said. And the renewable energy projects that have been built so far through the state uh, funding have somewhat of a range of performance that I think we can in some way attribute to some of them being operated and maintained a little bit better. Um, we have a lot of communities here in the state that are remote and don't have a ton of human capacity in that community. Uh, and that's contrasted with, let's say, uh, Alaska Village Electric Co-op, which runs 58 of our remote community utility grids. And so ABEC has this uh, economies of scale where they can develop human capacity and uh, perhaps uh, trade people, some of their staff around the whole state and move them around kind of a circuit rider type model. Um, a small community doesn't have that opportunity. If, if a small community has a project, then it's likely that they either have, some, have to have somebody who's in that community, living in that community, who's trained to take care of that project, or somehow work some arrangement with another community that will be able to share some of that uh, expertise and training. The, the folks in Kong, and you put a picture up there of the folks in Kong Gigamac um, are an interesting case because Kong is part of a, uh, a loose, relatively loose-knit group of communities uh, that's called the Shanina Quinn Group. So it's just not, it's not just Kong, but it's Kong, Quig, uh, Kipnuk, uh, Tintatuliak, and maybe one other organization, uh, Chifornak, I think. Those five, those five communities work together to do training. They work together to install the wind turbines. They, they work together when they need to work together. And I think that's the kind of smaller scale, not an AVEC scale, but a smaller scale uh, uh, association of communities that um, we have been looking at as uh, potential models. There's also a huge opportunity, I think, to work with local native corporations because most of the corporations also have a nonprofit arm. Um, so, for instance, right now, uh, we're working with folks in the Bristol Bay region, not just BBNC, but also BBNA, uh, and looking at the opportunities for developing uh, a, more of a local, regional training, 
not just center, but uh, training um, <coughs> opportunities for people who live in those regions. Um, because that it is crucial. If we don't have our operations and maintenance down, then you can put the best technology in, in the world, and you may not have the success that you're looking for. So that's a, a, a it's a real key for us, and one of the things that we launched a couple of years ago, again with Office of Naval Research funding, is something called the Alaska Network for Energy Education and Employment, or ANI. And our ANI director, Chris McConnell, is not here tonight, but the whole idea behind ANI was actually hatched with Gwen and others. We were talking about this eight or nine years ago because we kept reacting to all these um, education and training opportunities that were out there. And one day we just sat down and said, hey, if we were going to be proactive and we were going to create something, and, and, and develop something in the state for energy education and training, what would it look like? And, and the ANI model kind of uh, was born out of that. And the whole idea is we know that there are a lot of K-12 teachers out there um, who are enthusiastic about clean energy. They may not know each other. This is a big state. We know there's a lot of vocational technical folks around the state who care about clean energy. Again, they may not know each other. They may not know what's going on. 500, 600 miles away, and even we know there's a lot of great people at the university level who are interested in, in working with the clean energy industry. But again, they may not know each other. So the whole idea of ANI is to build sub-networks with K-12, Fopatech, and university and an umbrella network so that we can, into the future, both build energy literacy here in the state and develop career paths for young people. Um, I'm, I'm curious, um, and I want to hear also if there's folks in the audience that have questions. I think we're going to leave some time at yeah, the end for that. that. Um, um, I'm curious, um, you know, both from Gwen and Chris, two folks that I um, have admired for years and have been kind of watching their organizations as they grow. Um, can you articulate, I'm going to put you on the spot, but can you articulate, like, what is the vision for Alaska, like, 2050? If everything, everything we're doing, we're wildly successful, Beyond our wildest dreams, like take it to its logical end. What does Alaska look like? Can, can you can you uh, paint your kind of vision of, of what it, what the state looks like at that point? <laughs> so let's see. So we're talking about thirty years from now. You're good at math, you're an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> and I think like one of the things that I I think about a lot. Um, you know, we had this little bit of a sidebar conversation earlier today. Is you know, I've got kids right now. They're in fourth and sixth grade up in Fairbanks. And I think a lot about um, them. I, I've been trying to brainwash them to, to convince them that they're going to live in Alaska for the rest of their lives. So <laughs> I've convinced them that Alaska is the best place in the world, right? But in 30 years from now, you know, they're probably going to have their own kids, right? And so really thinking about what their lives, if they do choose to stay in Alaska and raise their kids, my grandkids, you know, here someday. Um, what what is it going to look like here? You know, and what I really like what at the end of the day I really think about is sort of a really bright future for our youth. You know, and I think that energy, whatever, food, transportation, you know, all this stuff sort of fits into that. You know, how can we become a more um, kind of self sufficient and self reliant society here in Alaska? You know, we've been very dependent on a single industry. Um, we're very reliant on federal resources here, and I would like to see us um, do more in terms of supporting local agriculture, small businesses, <coughs> um, local energy resources, where we um, are playing our role in sort of where I think that we need to transition to as a global society, but also <coughs> really doing that in a way that connects our youth to global opportunities, you know, so that I would like my kids to believe that they can stay in Alaska and be part of like a, um, a, a super, you know, interesting business, startup business maybe that's really connecting what we're doing here locally to global challenges, whether that's in energy or tech or whatever that looks like, um, but they can do that from here in Alaska and still kind of benefit from um, the amazing um, resources and land and beauty that we have here and live here but be part of the part of global solutions and that's what I really care about so really thinking about how we can kind of transition our society away from the kinds of reliances that we have now and I also know, you know the average I heard somewhere that the median number of years that someone spends in Alaska is seven years 
And that's really scary, right? Because this is where we are not making investments here in the same kind of way that, say, Icelanders are. Okay, you brought up you brought up Iceland first, so it's actually in Iceland. You know, people they grow up there. They might leave. They go for an education, but their you know parents and grandparents are there. They um, often go back to raise their kids because it's a great place to raise you know children. And so they're willing to think about and invest their resources in ways that's pretty different than I think the way that we think about investing our resources here. You know. Um, I work at the university, and it was pretty shocking to me to see that we were willing, as a state, to let our state university declare financial exigency, right? Like, like that's not valuing an investment in the future. I worry about our education system here. I worry about where we're investing and where we're um, choosing to put resources and um, and, and, and that's kind of like what I'd like to see us think about, is what resources, what infrastructure, what education system do we need to make sure people stay here beyond seven years and you know, start to really think of Alaska as the place that they call home and that they're willing to invest in. I, I love Gwen's vision. I'm just gonna add a few things. Um, to get all those things that you are hoping for, I think we have to have a really engaged populace, and that means people who are not only just voting um, every four years for president, but people who are voting in interim elections, people who are voting and running for local office, um, people who really take citizenship and democracy seriously, because I think part of the reason that we don't have the kinds of investments that you're talking about is that uh, people are a little bit distanced from those decisions. And the way our society is set up, it's supposed to be, um, <clears throat> the decisions are supposed to be made by uh, the, the, the majority. But if the majority is a, a really small slice uh, of the actual pop absolute population, then we're actually getting a lot of decisions made in this society by a relatively small group of people. So I think part of, of the vision has to also be getting people engaged and excited about being part of politics. And politics is a dirty word <laughs> for a lot of people, uh, but it shouldn't be. I mean, politics is, is you know, what we actually go overseas to defend our, you know, uh, we've we defended democracy around the world, we defend democracy here uh, in the United States, and, and that's, that's a political system. So I think we have to start to understand and, and teach children um, that that's a normal part of growing up too, is that you have to take some responsibility along with all the rights that we have in, in our society. So um, I love the vision that you're talking about because I think Alaska is one of the most amazing places on earth. I moved here 30 years ago now uh, because of the beauty, uh, not because of a job or anything else. And um, I hope there's a lot of other people who, who want to live here for that reason. But we got to have more opportunity. We've got to have a diversity, diversified economy. And I also think that because of climate, we're going to get more people moving here, whether we may anticipate that or not. People are going to be figuring out what many of us have already figured out, which is it's not dark all the time. It's not cold all the time. There's a lot of really cool things to do here. Um, and I, I think that there is an opportunity for us to, um, to attract uh, 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 more people here who are going to care about the future of this state. So we, 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 should, get, we should get to um, Q&A from you folks, so I think we've got another half hour or so. We'd love to answer the questions that many of you may have. You want to pass this microphone around, Greg, if anyone has a question? Hi. Um, tonight you've been talking about uh, technology and you've been talking about human capital as uh, things that are, are promoting a clean energy economy in the state. Um, but I'm curious what you think about um, to what extent federal policies, broadly considered, constitute a barrier to building a clean energy economy in the state. Um, I probably, more than most people, except maybe Scott, listen, spent time listening to hearings of the uh, Energy and Natural Resources Committee in the Senate, uh, chaired by our Senator Murkowski. And, um, Many of those hearings focus on barriers to innovation in energy presented by things like perverse incentives provided by the way that grids are, are regulated. Um, again, it's more, it's more of a problem with lower 48 probably. Or, um, how, uh, what else was I thinking of? 
But, um, oh, uh, well, for instance, one of the biggest things is the multi uh, hundred billion dollar per year subsidy, subsidy that the fossil fuel industry has received through federal regulations and laws and policies. So, to what extent should we go away thinking that the future is bright and we just need to, you know, keep teaching people in Alaska about clean energy and start and, and promoting innovation? Um, or what, to what extent do we need to focus on uh, changing I'll take a first crack at that. Um, I totally agree that there are a lot of barriers uh, at the federal level because we don't have a federal energy policy either. And uh, we do have a lot of reverse subsidies. Uh, on the other hand, a, a lot of the, the innovation in policy making has been happening at the state level for a long time, whether it's in energy or something else, and so I wouldn't want to uh, only focus, and I know you're not saying that, but I wouldn't want to put too much focus on just the federal change um, because the state has an opportunity to have, the state, even though we don't have an energy policy yet, has an opportunity to have a great energy policy. If you think about it, 730,000 people, we should be able to turn on a dime, relatively speaking. You know, we, we don't have 40 million people like California uh, that have to go through a, you know, a political process to change their politics and to change their regulations, uh, even though they're, they're, I think, already headed in the right direction. So I, I still have a lot of uh, faith, I think, that Alaskans can change relatively quickly. And I also think that uh, the policy drivers that I, I mentioned earlier are, are um, not going away. They're only going to get bigger. And so I also think that uh, more and more people are going to have to submit to um, new thinking and new ideas relatively quickly. And both, that's going to be happening both at the state and federal level. Um, so there was, there was a fellow in town recently that um, was an investor, a private equity investor, that was looking at a couple of projects that one of our companies is doing, and um, those of us who have been here for a while were kind of managing expectations and saying like, oh, this, this thing is tough, this thing is tough, like maybe we're a little jaded. And his perspective, which I thought was really interesting, was like, from an investment perspective, his view is is if the if the economics are there and they're compelling enough, everything else will change behind it eventually. Maybe soon, maybe two years, and maybe ten years. But like invest in the fundamentals, the economics of these projects, and and that and that will drive policy at some point. If you look at what's happening nationally. Um, What's the latest? Uh, Twelve states have um, now come out with 100% renewable um, targets. Um, you know, and some of those states, you know, uh, Texas, deep red state, is you know, the, the largest penetration of wind in the country. Um, and and the, you know that's driven, I think, largely because all of a sudden you don't have to convince people that to do this. Like the the, the economics are there with these technologies. It's so like my, I guess my optimistic, I'm, I'm, I'm probably over, overly optimistic about these things, but my view is that like, it's gonna happen not at all, not at all, not at all, but then all at once. Um, and because the fundamentals are so compelling that, that it's no longer, you know, like renewables are no longer a toy and a science project of people that are smoking weed out in you know, the Oregon wilderness. Like this stuff is blue collar industry at scale, you know, mini megawatt um, PPAs at four cents a kilowatt. I mean like, this is blue collar middle America industry now. And as soon as that starts to happen, like you're starting to see, you know, kind of the, the um, across the political spectrum, folks that are starting to come around to renewals because they just see the job opportunity and they see the economic opportunity. And as soon as the, I think as soon as you get kind of the political right wrapping their arms around this, it's gonna happen all at once. Um, you know, like, um, I know it's chaos right now <laughs> on the federal level, but there's, I think there's some really interesting things that are starting to happen um, from my perspective. So, you know, one thing that I would, that I really hope for on a federal level is that, you know, the, the PTC for wind and solar, the, the production tax credit and investment tax credit for, um, for wind and solar, which are all of a sudden being talked about, possibly being extended. I really hope that there's a storage production tax credit and a storage investment tax credit. I think that would be super helpful because wind and solar are kind of there now 
And what we need is, is to kind of unlock deployment and storage at the federal level. So I, um, and I think that's starting to, there's some, there's some conversation at the federal level about, about getting that kind of a tax credit for storage. Um, so I'd be excited about that, if that could come together. Policies uh, do impact us here in Alaska. I mean, there's some, you know, obvious examples. Uh, you mentioned the production and, and the investment tax credits. Kind of the up and down roller coaster of that doesn't just affect Alaska, but sort of the uncertainty, um, the uncertain business environment that that sort of creates is a negative all around. That sort of like lack of having a long term energy policy or vision that creates certainty for businesses in terms of making investments is sort of a challenge. Um, Things like the EPA and looking at like tier four emissions requirements for diesel generators in rural Alaska. You know the fact that um, we've had some some recent uh, wins in that area actually for getting exemptions for Alaska utilities um, in rural Alaska. That's a good thing, I think. Um, but uh, in, 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 in large part, I think Alaska kind of marches to a slightly different drummer. We're sometimes out of sync of what's happening at the national level. Like one thing is, you know, when you look at, um, at the federal level um, or at the national level, like looking at the coal industry, right? Um, how many new coal power plants were built in the United States last year? One. 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 Does anyone know where it was? <laughs> Fairbanks, Alaska, right? That was the only new coal-fired power plant in Alaska last year, and that wasn't really a policy reason. That was purely economics, right? And it was economics for why it was built in Fairbanks, for that matter, right? Um, because it was primarily a heat plant um, using a local resource. We don't have natural gas available locally in Fairbanks. Um, as, a, as a way to heat the campus there. So, you know, there's, a, there's ways I think that Alaska, and, and Chris mentioned that states are often sort of incubators uh, for innovative policy. I really very much believe that Alaska could be that as well, and that's what I would like to see. I'd like to see us um, be creative and innovative in thinking through um, policy solutions, technical solutions, and business solutions to kind of move ourselves forward. And because we are a small society, I totally agree that we can we can um, do things quickly should we decide that that is what we want to have happen. So I have a couple comments, but one, one follow-up on what you're just saying. Um, in terms of the business aspects of alternative energy, um, this summer saw a huge increase in local solar in Anchorage through the um, Alaska Center's initiative. And to me, that's a, a national policy affecting local businesses. And unfortunately, the credit that got a lot of us to buy our systems this year and increase uh, those companies' revenues for the whole year is decreasing over time, and then goes away. And so these businesses are basing their model on um, their customers' overall economic situations and seeing if 30% on that cost is going to help them or not. And it, do you guys see any, you know, kind of national movement to, to continue those credits at that higher level because it does impact local businesses in, in probably every state? And, and, and then, um, there was a statistic, this is a question too, statistic about um, energy being, uh, renewable energy being produced in Alaska, and have you looked into how much more has been um, brought online because of the tax credits this particular year, because these guys were so busy. I mean, I started a, my system um, in May, and I, just started generating a couple weeks ago, but part of that was MLP's fault, so I won't go into that. Um, and that's a training issue. Maybe that's what you need to ask. The investment tax credit that you're talking about is one, of your, is one of the tax credits, along with the production tax credit that uh, Isaac just alluded to, that there is now some renewed discussion in Congress about extending. And I don't know whether that'll happen or not. Um, it, it, it is, in my opinion, unfair that renewables have such a small percentage of federal energy subsidies relative to fossil fuels. But in general, you, you do want subsidies to end over time. In general, you do see that 
and we, what, the whole idea behind them is that you get a industry off the ground and then it becomes self-sustaining and, and then it moves on without the subsidies and at some point the, the renewable energy industry has to you know say you know we we're good and the wind industry in particular um, was saying that four years ago when they negotiated the end of these tax credits in Congress there was a negotiated end to that um, whether or not we'll see a reopening of those neg negotiations or not I don't know but the cost of solar is going to continue to go down tariffs aside now, they may or may not impact um, the cost to consumers in the short term, but the cost of solar panels will continue to go down. So even if the, the investment tax credit goes down, hopefully people will still see that it's a value. Um, the other issue that's much more local that in, uh, I think impacts people's willingness to uh, purchase a solar system is their ability to net meter with the local utilities and there's also right now discussion about increasing that cap that the regulatory commission put on net metering when they developed the administrative rule 10 years ago they said that the utilities only had to net meter up to 1.5 percent of their load and a few of the utilities are already getting close to that home electrics just announced that they're willing unilaterally increase that to three percent so we're hoping that the other utilities will do that as well. Um, in the big scheme of things though, the production tax credit, which supports um, commercial utility scale <coughs> renewables, is probably putting more renewable electricity on the grid than the investment tax credit that helps um, rooftop solar. Thank you. What do you see as uh, sort of projects that are right, clean energy projects in Alaska, and what sort of likely funding sources for those? Do you mean like uh, commercial utility scale projects? That, or just in general? Well, rooftop solar is going to continue to be attractive for a lot of people. Um, and that's going to be you know, distributed energy on people's homes and businesses. Um, from a utility scale, um, we talked a little bit about the microgrids and what's going on um, in rural Alaska. There's going to be more, uh, I think, communities that are going to be trying to increase the contribution of renewables like wind and solar and battery storage is going to play a big part of that. On the grid here, um, I would um, suggest considering coming back for our November 7th discussion because we're going to be talking about some of the barriers to putting more renewables on the grid here in the rail belt which are you know largely uh, due to the fact that we, we don't have a regional system we don't have regional interconnection system we don't have uh, promulgated standards for regional reliability yet we don't have regional planning we don't have regional transmission tariff and all those things are, are making it very difficult for renewable projects or frankly any independent power producers to get into this grid and to compete in the grid. So REAP is really focused a lot now on electric grid reform as a first step toward laying the, the, the uh, table, if you will, setting the table for more renewable projects to come in, whether this be wind, large-scale wind, um, or possibly you know, in the future, we hope, tidal technology will, will uh, be past emerging and be commercial. And there's also the possibility, for instance, a geothermal project at Mount Spur, who knows. Um, but there's opportunities out there that are not going to probably be um, invested in by the private sector at all until the grid issues that I just mentioned are resolved. Yeah, yeah and I would add to that. Um, I was just up in Canada a couple weeks ago. Um, they, the, you know, Alaska has a, a pretty nice sovereign wealth fund of 50 Two billion, fifty-four billion, something like that. Um, Canada's sovereign wealth fund, the, um, the one that's based out of um, out of kind of the Montreal region, is a four hundred and fifty billion dollar sovereign wealth fund. And on their homepage, you know, right on the front front center, it says we've joined with five of the other world's largest sovereign wealth funds to invest over one point three trillion over the next couple of years in solutions to climate change. Um, that's a big, like there's a lot of zeros on that. The, the, other, the other thing that I think is really interesting is that um, in like the venture capital space, if, you're, if you go to some of these VC conferences now, 
everything is ESG, 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 like that's all the people are talking about, which is environmental, social governance. And these are the, like, these are the big VC funds. These are like the ones that have been around for 20 years. Um, they're the people who are putting their, you know, like the generational wealth who's putting money into those VC funds. They're now starting to be pushed to invest in, you know, in technologies and companies that are taking the environmental side and the social side and the governance side really seriously. So VCs is another source of money. Foundations, a lot of these foundations that have been over the course of a couple of decades looking at um, investing, um, using grant making um, mechanisms, so putting out 500,000 to help some nonprofit get up and running. Um, with zero, with kind of zero, kind of, you know, plans for any kind of return off that. A lot of those those foundations are now going. Can we take that grant making money and instead turn it into impact investing, where we earn back one or two percent? But now we're telling our investors that we're investing in climate, and there is so much money available. Um, you know, th this has been a large part of kind of, kind of our life um, or, or my life for the last few months because we have companies. They have solutions. We have people in Alaska who have said we're dying of energy costs and we have needs. You know, like, what is the disconnect here? Why, if the solutions are there, if we have a bunch of money, you know, people are willing to spend money on that. If we have people that have shown needs, why are we not seeing more projects get done? Um, and I think that, you know, policy is a part of that. I also think it's just getting projects packaged and getting people together to do the kind of unsexy work of taking an entire utility and saying like, let's have a vision for what your utility is gonna do over the next 20 years. Let's like create a roadmap and then let's start creating public-private partnerships to get this done. Um, I think that's like a big part of the work that, that all of us are going to be needing to do over the next 20 years. Um, it's like that, that project packaging, like, you know, the problem is not lack of money that's available, the project, the problem is, lack of velocity of projects, people that are out there that are just, you know, packing pack these projects and, and, and floating them up so that we can have private partner, part, um, you know, public-private partnerships. The other, the other obvious one that I think is willing to play, and there's a lot of work, like, from within DOD and across the federal agencies, is they're starting to think about how can they leverage through public-private partnerships this capital, this private capital that's wanting to be spent on climate and how can they start structuring, you know, like kind of like the capital stack so that the federal money takes maybe higher risk and goes in to do some of the project um, design and some initial engineering and the scoping of the project and then you let private investors come in um, to put in money to help a project scale or to actually earn interest off of it. And so like designing, designing kind of the capital stack where you're including federal and you're including foundations and you're including some of the the private investment, um, I think it's a huge opportunity. That is the problem that we need to be solving because everything else is kind of ready to go. There's a little thing called the Green Bank too that um, I've heard about. Well, well I was just going to mention that uh, what he, what Isaac just described, when you design the, the financing stack, when you design a loan program that can address that, that is what a green bank does. In fact, that is something that uh, REAP is working to develop. That is something that other states are working to develop or have developed. And, and that's a way for a small, a relatively small, modest amount of, of state or federal money to leverage a whole he heck of a lot of private investment um, by de-risking the project for the private investors. So that's a big deal, I think, uh, in terms of getting a lot of, especially small projects going, um, but, because uh, a lot of the bigger projects, they have they have sources of money. It's the small mom and pop projects and the energy efficiency projects that are gonna really, I think, uh, get a lot out of uh, at a green bank if we can develop one here in the state. I mean, I just, I'll agree with that. I mean, our, our big challenge here in Alaska is kind of scale of projects and um, high transaction costs, you know, related to, to getting getting deals done. Um, it doesn't help that we have over 100 certified utilities in Alaska. So, you know, who do you work with? Like, uh, and, and, and if you get a deal done here, it doesn't necessarily translate to other markets, you know, so in Alaska. 
So, um, so I think that that's kind of one of the big challenges we have, and if we can address some of those things through creative financing um, tools that we develop here in state, that, that, that helps. And we have done that in the past. Um, that's really a big um, a way, a, a, there was a big uptick in projects in the state um, 10 years ago was with the Renewable Energy Fund, but that hasn't really had any significant amounts of financing um, that's, or funding that's been put into that in the last few years, and yet I just, and this is not, I, I actually would like to get some statistics on this, but I haven't necessarily observed that there's been a, a big slowdown in project development. Um, with that uh, reduction in funding. I mean, there's still projects coming online, there's still things that are happening, despite the fact that that tool hasn't been um, part of the toolkit for many, many, um, many project developers or communities or utilities, um, there's still things happening. We're just getting creative and finding other ways to make projects work. So a lot of this discussion so far has been about cost. And we've got some comments about regulatory uh, circumstances or subsidies. But when it comes right down to cost, I think, Chris, you posted a, uh, a really terrific nationwide average in the Lazard Asset Management's levelized cost of electricity graphic you posted. Uh, that that's the cradle to grave cost of different sources of electricity as a nationwide average. Have you seen that for different regions of Alaska? And uh, boy, if you haven't, that'd be fantastic for education purposes, because I've not seen that. Um, I think it would be fantastic if you could at least uh, comment on the rough costs or relative costs of uh, diesel in remote Alaska versus wind. Uh, I mean, our cheapest electric power in the state is from hydro resources, mostly in Southeast, that you know, were funded with you know some sort of state funding, you know, decades ago, right? Um, so we have communities in Alaska that are paying I don't know nine cents a kilowatt hour for power, and uh, and and they and they use that electric power for space heating, for example, you know, in, in some cases. Um, so there's, in my opinion little doubt that hydro in Alaska is probably, on average, the cheapest source um, of electric power for the communities that have it, especially storage hydro with a dam, basically, right? Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's my observation. In terms of wind versus diesel, you know, one of the things that we don't do a very good job of taking into account with all of this is really thinking about um, long-term price impacts, right? So one thing that utilities like about wind energy, especially in rural Alaska, is that there's a lot more certainty about the long-term costs associated with that. And there's quite a lot of value um, for them that's tied up in that. So if you kind of know approximately what you're going to be paying for that wind energy, which you're amortizing over the lifetime of that project, because the capital costs are really where the most of the cost is, um, there's some real value in that, and it's hard to kind of quantify what that value is. But the cost of installing wind in Alaska is not the same as these large wind farms that we see in the rest of the country. Um, I think that AVAC has estimated that they've, in, at least historically, paid, I don't know, what, $10,000 a, a kilowatt for installed wind, which is very high. It's much higher than you would see at the national level. Um, so, you know, I think that um, the other thing is that a lot of the benefit, I mean, these, these are things that need to be really thought through. Subsidies, we've talked about, are a real disincentive for developing um, alternatives, you know, whatever those subsidies are for. One of the reasons in Alaska that we've actually developed a lot more renewables than, say, in northern Canada is because our subsidies are actually relatively low. And for rural Alaska, those subsidies only are applied to um, residential customers, which is maybe about a third of the kilowatt hours that are sold in most communities, just kind of back of the envelope numbers. So two thirds of the kilowatt hours sold um, for government users, a school, whatever, or commercial users, like a fish processing facility, um, they pay the full cost of electric power. And, it, and in many, many communities, in a larger hub community, it might be somewhere um, between around 30 cents a kilowatt hour and in a community where you're maybe flying fuel in, like Shungnak in, in, uh, in the Nana region, it might be above a dollar a kilowatt hour. 
for, for electric power. <coughs> so there's like huge variance, uh, but those places where the cost is very high, um, that really provides this opportunity to, to transition to renewables. Canada subsidizes more heavily, so you see less incentive to transition. And so it's kind of like an interesting dynamic. Um, so if you talk to a utility like Alaska Village Electric Cooperative, they would say that they um, have seen reductions in the cost of electric power for commercial and, and, uh, and government users that are paying the full um, amount of power. But for residential users that are actually getting the subsidy, the benefit actually goes back to the state which is kind of an interesting thing, and the residential users don't see any reduction in their rate. Now, that's been a conundrum that has been thought about or talked about quite a bit, and when the state was funding a lot of these projects, that made some sense, but now that the state isn't necessarily funding these projects, should the state be seeing that benefit, or should that benefit um, somehow aggregate to the community or whoever's investing in that project. So these are really interesting policy questions, and Chris is the one that we count on to be um, really thinking about how we can solve some of those problems. Any other questions? We're about, we're about there, unless there's one last burning question. Otherwise, we can just wrap it up. Yeah, well, thank you everybody for coming down tonight. Um, remember, November 7th, we'll be back here up on the fourth floor talking about the electric grid. And November 5th, if you're not in Fairbanks, tune in online and we'll be doing uh, a good conversation up there on the 5th. And yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you to the panelists and, and our sponsors. Yeah.